for those are the folks that are joining us, um, we had a little pre-discussion before we got started here. That's why we're late um, uh, getting started here because we were uh, having some pre-discussion on some things, um, on some other matters, especially on Sunday morning and so forth that we've been going through um, the sermon series. And uh, please stay tuned. Stay tuned for that uh, on Sunday mornings. Uh, again, Sunday morning, ten o'clock. You know, for worship. Uh, things of that nature. Uh, and please share that with anybody you wish to share it with. Tonight we are in Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse um, 15. That's where we'll begin. And our goal is to get through uh, the first half of chapter 7. Because the meat of chapter 7 really is in the second part. We won't get to that tonight. But we'll begin with the setup of that as we go through uh, our lesson tonight. We're going to have a quick word of prayer and let God lead us the rest of the way. And so let's have a prayer and our uh, and I will begin from there. Let us pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this day that we've not seen. Thank you, Lord, for your justice. And thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace that continues, Lord, to remind us of your justice, of your equity and equality, oh God, amongst humanity. We ask right now, Lord, that you lead us in the study of Romans, Lord. It's been so great and so good. And you've given us so much. We just ask, Lord, that you meet us in this place tonight so that, Lord, we are fed once again. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do. Bless us now and keep us and allow us to see your glory in the midst of your word. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, chapter 6. Any questions from last week in that first part of chapter 6? Where, again, dead to sin, um, um, dead to sin and alive in Christ, uh, being crucified in his death. You know, I'm just giving highlights here. Um, uh, do not let sin reign in our mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself uh, as an instrument of wickedness. Again, uh, and it says again, for uh, sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but you're under grace. So we're understanding that placement of where the law is with regards to the placement of grace by way of the cross and understanding how each operates for us. Uh, that the law in and of itself couldn't save us, Okay. But the law also gave us a roadmap of what sin is. Okay, and that's important because of the standpoint that we can see what sin is. God pointed out, we know what it is and know that we need to stay away from it. Okay, so it's by the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ that leads us to, to be able to be victorious over sin because of the death of Christ, but his resurrection because he defeated death. He defeated death. And one of the uh, motifs that I keep going over and over again in the book of Romans is that sin equals death. So the thing is, is that you have to look at, at, at Christ who defeated death, which meant he defeated sin at Calvary's hill. Okay? Calvary's hill and the, and the, and the empty tomb and resurrection thereof. So we're now in chapter number six, uh, the second half of it. And we're going to hope to get through the first half of chapter seven on tonight. So with this, I want to read, um, I want to read through these verses of scripture um, in the first and uh, the second half of chapter six and in chapter six. And we'll get some discussion going before we kind of jump into seven, hoping in the second half of the study tonight. I'm reading from the New International Version of God's Word. This is what it says. It says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from the from your heart, the pattern of teaching that has now that has now claimed your allegiance, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Yet, as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? 
those things resulted in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So the connection again here is this now is the slave talk that Paul begins because this is something that the Roman church, of course, would understand from that perspective. But he's using it from the context, of course, of being a slave to sin or being a slave to God's righteousness. That's the difference that he's making. And what he begins with, he says, says then shall we shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace by no means. And so that connection he brings in verse 15 bridges us that uh, he says, shall we you know, sin because we are not under the law, but we're under grace. Okay. So he says, no, by no means, he said, because you really shouldn't be playing with the grace of God. Because that's exactly what it is. It's God's grace that has saved us. So we don't go on sinning. We, we choose our side because we chose Christ. Or we haven't chose Christ. And so there's that connection that, that Paul makes that is given the argument that, okay, well, since we're not under the law, but we're, by, it's, um, but we're, we're, we're under grace, then should we go ahead and, and sin? So that, that's, play, that's, playing, that's playing God, playing God uh, as a bellhop to some degree. Where, where you're saying, well, since I'm under grace, then, hey, I can go ahead and sin then. Because grace is going to cover me. That's not how grace works, God's grace works. It's not to give you permission to sin because you're under grace. It's to give you the acknowledgement in your mind and your soul that these things of, 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 of God, the things that are prescribed in the law, are wrong and that they're sin. And so it should give me a 180 turn in order to live my life according to the standards of Christ. And this doesn't become a crush. This doesn't become... Uh, Lord, do this for me. And basically, you, you're playing with God from that perspective. That's not the point of this because you can't sit here and play with God's grace. God extends it, but it's now a transformation that must happen and began to happen and continue to happen in your life from the state of wanting to be away from the sinful nature. And that's the connection that now Paul begins. He said, now, what, what are you going to be a slave to? Are you going to be a slave to righteousness or are you going to be a slave to sin? There's no middle ground. Let's, 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 put, let's put it out there. And so he bridges this in order for us to understand that connection of being obedient to, uh, to God, but not being a slave, of course, to, uh, to sin. He said, which leads to death. Or obedience, which leads to righteousness. So now there's there's an action that comes with us with regards to whatever we choose. There's an action that comes with it. Is that action righteous in God's eyesight, or is it sinful in God's eyesight? Which now one separates, of course, us from God. The other brings us closer, closer to God. So he brings this up again in this in in talking this through, so that it becomes that connection. Okay. A connection, you know, is, is begin, beginning to be sewn in that much more, that we are truly servants of righteousness. Um, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey your heart, uh, to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. So you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. So because of the teaching, because of the maturation, because of the preaching of the gospel and the character of God, that now begins to show you the pattern of where you should go, but also there's still a choice that you're making as to where your allegiance will lie. Okay? And all of this is, is so important in our walk because think about the context of Rome. Okay? There's a lot that's out there. There was a lot out there in Rome for them to really mess up, mess up in, okay? Because of those contexts, 
What he's trying to do for the church is say, look, there's a pattern that you must follow that is of God's character and must not resemble the societal piece of what of where the place you are. You're supposed to be light and darkness. You're supposed to be that light that is different and peculiar. So now there has to be a connection that's there that helps you to understand and connect with regards to the standpoint of, of that difference. Don't allow your flesh to get caught up in sin, in sinful nature, and be, and be disobedient. Don't play with God's grace. If you have accepted Christ, that means you wish to be transformed. You wish to become more like Christ. And that becomes now your character down and it continues to be built up. I hope you see that Paul is trying to put some building blocks for this church. He's trying to establish some building blocks for them because of ministry and also how the church will be challenged. Okay, how the church will be challenged. These building blocks are the standard standard of how we should be led and directed by way of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the connection now comes in, where is that, okay, you got to choose obedience that leads to God's righteousness, or you're going to choose sin that leads to death. That there's no middle ground. You, you, you've, got, you've got to make a choice. So when you choose Christ, we're moving down that direction. And remember, we're talking sanctification now. So as we talk of sanctification, it's the improvement and maturation of your faith as you are continuing to live your life after being saved. Questions, comments, anything? You know how that old saying goes, I'm not what I used to be, mm -hmm. but I, and I'm not what I'm going to be. And if you look at the world and look at what, what is going on in the world, things that are not godly do cause death. Um, I think about people who use drugs excessively, alcohol excessively, uh, fornication going on, all of these things, if they don't turn their lives around, ultimately it leads to death. It will, it will lead to death. And remember, if it's leading to death, it's leading to a place It's where it's Satan, is, Satan is attempting to separate you. Right. Complete, continue to separate you from God. Drawing nigh unto God means that not only am I praying, not, I'm, I'm looking at my behavior. I'm looking at the things I do. I'm looking at these things. Are, is this acceptable to God? Is, is this obedient to his character? Character. And if not, then there's, there's, there's some, some, some challenge that has to be done. And every person that's under the auspices of the Holy Spirit to have given their lives over to Christ and his salvation are always challenged with this in various elements and places in their lives. Okay? This is the beauty of Christ, is that Christ will not turn you away. Christ will not turn you away. Christ will not point the finger and, ju and judge you to the point of condemnation. He still opens it up with regards to salvation, but he also knows that we're still in the flesh. He still knows we're in the flesh. And that's why it's so important. He said, what are you leaning to? Are you leaning to the things of God? Or are you leaning to the things that promote death, which is sin? I'm sorry, Brother Bennett, you're about to say something. You know, if we, we think, if we go back to ancient times and the Leviticus days and whatnot, where the law was the law. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with the law, but yet it was almost like certain taskmasters. Hmm. You know, and I mean, you were up under a master then, but you were not up under the heavenly master. Uh huh. We were up under uh, laws that we couldn't even keep. Keep. But the taskmasters was on you, mm -hmm. knowing that you were going to do wrong. So they had all the power to put you down. Yes, to the side. To the side. And, 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 it's, and it's amazing that that's why the law couldn't say it. it's, it's too it's too much to try to obey all this. And these become the standards by which we get to heaven. No, no. Remember, the law was to identify to us what sin is, what sin is. Jesus paid it all at Calvary. Paid it all at Calvary. The choice becomes, what do you choose? Now I choose Christ. Now if I choose Christ, and I now know that my sins are under subjection to the cross, that now, since he defeated sin and death, 
that now means that anything that he has done now becomes the proclivity in which I live in in order to be stretched and move further away from sin even when I'm in sin. <laughs> to move further away from sin. Now watch this. I'm going to connect this to the um, Sermon on the Mount. Again, Jesus always kept saying, saying, he said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. You've heard it said, thou shalt not steal. What I'm telling you is, if you even think it, you've already said if you even think it, you've already sinned. But it's not to the place of condemnation because now if you place that thought subjective to the cross, God can deal with it based off your belief that you're already saved. That's why also the penalty of you thinking something versus doing it is also much lesser. But at the same time, in God's sight, he looks at all of it the same. So you want to talk about grace? Grace is when God takes and says in the Sermon on the Mount, you've already sinned because you thought. But now since you held that thought captive to the Holy Spirit and the cross, I can now deal with it so that you don't, that you don't commit the act, that you don't actually go through with it. Because guess what? God also knows that the penalty is much greater if you do it versus you thinking it. That's, that's a grace piece. And I'll tell anyone that. That is a grace piece because now you've thought it, but you haven't acted on it. There's a difference between thinking and doing. And we see that in the world. And that's in the construct of how God has created all things. No one's going to arrest you for a thought. <laughs> no one's going to send you to prison for a thought. You're not going to get drunk based off a thought. You see the convenience store or the ABC store and you turn around and get in the car and leave. The thought was there, but you didn't act on it. You subjected that thought into the auspices of the cross because we know there's power because of the salvation of Christ. And if you ask me, the, the, uh, the thought of the act and actually doing the act, that's why Christ preached Catch the thought. Because you don't want to go here. Because if you go here, there's a whole nother amount of stuff that you're going to have to deal with if you go there. So there's a grace factor when the thought is held captive and put under subjection of the cross. Yes, you sin, but does the thought kill you? Does the thought move you to a place where you're going to prison? Does the thought move you to alcoholism? Does the thought if you've already held the thought captive to the power, to the power, the thought of sin, and held it captive under the power to absolve sin. See, that's that holy master that working inside. Yes. That holy master is, is saying, no, no, if, if, if you mean what I don't understand, it ain't happening. That Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If, if, you, if there's any verse of scripture you want to memorize, it's definitely that one. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That, the Holy Spirit is speaking even in that, in that scripture. In the movement, put your thoughts and make your thoughts subjective to God. So even when the bad thought happens, yes, you sin, but you haven't carried it out. You haven't carried it out. You ask God for forgiveness and also ask God for strength in that area of whatever weakness that is. And if you ask me, that's, that's, I think that's part of God's grace. Because you can't hold sin captive under the cross if you haven't given yourself over to the cross yet. Mm -hmm. See? Because it must be held under the victory contained in the death and resurrection of Christ. Questions, comments? Okay, all right. So, what we have here, as we keep going, going further, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey, um, obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin 
and have become slaves to righteousness. And then Paul says, I am using a human, using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to every ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. So this is where he now is seeing, showing the bridge that when you're, when you're, when you're um, offering yourselves over to the things of righteousness, it leads to a sacred space with God. That's where it ends up leading. So, so for every time you're able to deny yourself and take up your cross, <laughs> and take up your cross, what you're doing is there's a level of suffering that comes in that when you don't choose. Watch this. When you don't choose sin and you choose obedience, what you're saying to your flesh is, I'm going to allow you to suffer, allow you to suffer so that you can get more of the righteousness of God and show you that you don't need that in your life. There's no level of dependence that you have to sin. See, that's what sin wants to do. Sin wants to say, you need this. That's what sin does. And, t and tempt you. And, and sin is going uh, to make itself attractive to you in such a way that you're going to feel it's a necessity when really it isn't. And that's why God says, subject your thoughts. Uh, be transformed. You'll see this later in Romans. Because he makes the same statement again. But th that, this statement in, in Romans 12, when we get there, um, um, makes it submit, submit your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. When we get there, what Paul's going to begin to do is show the connection between your transformation in Christ and how you worship him. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> so now it's a matter of the transformation that has happened that now translates into how you worship. And then people wonder why. Well, why does the pastor keep telling me we need to praise God? We need to praise God. We need to praise God. You need to praise God because he's worthy to be praised. If you really think about where you are right now, you will understand why you need to praise God. Think about your testimony and think about how God has transformed you. How you, not like you were 10 years ago or even five minutes ago. And that's why it, it's, it's, it, it does something once you are able to recollect in your spirit what God has done for you, which now translates because you submitted yourself to God and the transformation thereof now translates into my reasonable act of service and worship. I worship God not so that you can see me run around the church. I worship God because I know what I used to be. Amen. I worship God because I know who I was about to cuss out last week and I didn't. I know I, it's being it's being real, but it's showing the power and the transformation, translate transformational power of God. And when you get that in your spirit, that's relational. No, nobody can take that. But that's between you and God. So you want to look at me for look at me for That's fine because it ain't you. It's not about you, and really it ain't about me. I'm thinking about what God has done for me, and I just say that all praise belongs to him because I know I've been transformed by the word of God and because of that it has kept me from doing certain things that I thought I was about to do but God held me from it and I didn't do it. Amen. Count it all joy. Count it all see it all makes it when James said count it all joy when you when you when you come into divers temptations. Just count it all joy. The reason why he says it is because Guess what? Satan wouldn't be coming after you. He wouldn't be coming after you if he didn't if he didn't see something spiritually that was already on you. Seize the presence of God.
Y'all told y'all about Job. Y'all know about Job. And God says, consider my servant Job, Satan. There he is. He said, I have considered him. But you've got a hedge of protection around. I can't get to him. I can't get to you. If you lift the hedge, I'll make him curse you to your face. He said, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's why the community of faith is so important in our lives. Because this is where we have to uphold each other up. Because all of us are still tra are traveling down the same road. So we must give encouragement one to another. Amen. In our most dire states. Amen. This is why when Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, around the end of that pericope, he says, after he tells them, he says, now we have not, uh, you know, uh, well, not that not we all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That's, that's in one of the Corinthian books. But when he talks about it and basically says that, uh, you know, uh, basically when we die, when we die, that we'll all be changed. That we'll all be changed. And he tells them uh, at the great trumpet sound that the dead in Christ will rise first. Will rise first. And then those who will remain will be caught up. Be caught up. So for those who are dealing with bereavement, I'm paraphrasing now. For those who are dealing with bereavement, he says, comfort one another with these words. And it's not just death, physical death. This is every aspect of our lives that we have to build each other up with the word of God that has already been established in us. Because where one is weak, we're all weak. Where one is strong, we're all strong. Strengthen your brother and your sister. Lift them up. Lift them up. Because we all need lifting. We all need motivation. We all need encouragement. We all need to be reminded of the power of God. And it's still evident even now. I've just learned as a pastor, sometimes it's just not what you say. It's just about being there. And, when, when, and it's just about being present. And I, and I always think about this in places where many members have sat. Uh, and I always go back to bereavement. You know, I think of moments where folks were in, in a very dire place. And it's not about saying a word sometimes. It's just about being there. It's just about being there. When, when, when I know, when, when, when your sister had passed. Your sister had passed. I made a point. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to Shelby. Make it, I'm going to show. I said, I don't need to go on program. I don't need, I'm just going to step foot in the room. That's all, 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 I just want to be there. And I, and all, all times what I assess is, and like I said, it takes, a, it takes being under a good pastor to know and appreciate this. That literally, when I step foot in the room, I could tell a light turned on. Just the simple fact that their pastor showed up. That's it. That he showed up. That's it. That's it. Dr. Kimbrough showed me years ago, and when I was going through mentor ministry when I was at Gordon Conwell, he said, You can come with me today. It was after a church service. You can come with me today. I said, Where are we going? He said, You don't need to know about that. <laughs> Pastor K like that sometimes. Uh, he said, Don't worry about that. He said, we, we, he said You're going to drive. He said, I'm going to ride with you. He said, We're going over to Ozon and Mizan on the Steel Creek area. I said, what was going on there? He said, one of our members, her mother died. He's the funerals today. He said, and what, he's the whole point of this is part of your mentor ministry. He said, what you ought to learn from this is the power of presence. That's all he said, the power of presence. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to examine. He told me who the member was. He said, I want you to examine when I, when I step foot in the room. He said, I want you to find her. Find her and, and try to make eye contact with her. Because she's going to look back at the door when the door opens. He said, and I want you to see her face when her pastor walks in. He said, now mind you, has nothing to do with Kimbrough. He said, but Kimbrough happens to be the under-shepherd. And because I'm the under-shepherd for her, he said, there's going to be something that you're going to see in that. As soon as I walked in the room, he told me to walk in first. So I went, walked in, sat down. 
Pastor K came in, and when he came in, he stood at the door. He stood at the door for about, about five seconds and tried to figure out which way he was going to go up to the pulpit because the pastor was already kind of waving him in. I looked at our number, and when she turned around, the frown she had on her face just was sadness turned into an immediate smile. Immediate. 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 And then I saw, I saw her smile. And I, I, I could literally see her breathe, like, just exhaust, where it literally, where she was just relieved. It's not, it's sometimes it's not about the words. It's about just being present. And that's where the encouragement comes in. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the pastor. That can come from anybody. In the church, that just shows the love and says, you're not by yourself. You're not alone. You're not alone. Now think about how isolated Christ was at Calvary. Everyone left. The disciples gone. Gone. The folks around, around him. And, and with this, he's by himself. But the whole point when you see in the Bible, which is listed hundreds of times, where God says, I what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Nor forsake you. Because he knows what that looks like. And he wants us to also remember how forsaken he was in that moment. Now mind you, he's carrying the sins of the world. And why would Jesus start quoting Psalm 22 of all psalms? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a psalm of David. He starts quoting that on the cross. Because I honestly believe that God temporarily turned his back on Christ. Not because of Christ, but because of the sin that Christ was carrying for all of us. That temporarily, God just turned his back. Just turned his back. He fed me not. It's thirsty. When I, was in, when I was in prison, did you come and visit me? Doing. All of that. Because what, what, is, what does that say, Brother Bennett? It says you're not alone. You're not by yourself. It is. Sister Neely, it, it, loneliness is a terrible, is a terrible thing. And that's, and that's one of the reasons why it is so important when you're in a community of faith that we always are lifting each other up because you don't know when you're going to need to be lifted. Amen. You don't know. You don't know. Because it's what the world throws at us. The experiences that we have in the world, we need to be lifting each other up. Not judging one another. Not putting our nose up the folk. No, we need to love one another and lift each other up. We must do it. Wow. So, as we get in here, he, he says, when, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? See, now what he does, he says, okay, you did all that ratchetness. You did all that sin. How did, how did, how, how did you come out with it? Did you come out better or worse? How you, so, so, cause sin, the, the, the guys that sin uses, it says, come and indulge in me. I'll make you feel good. I, 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 it's it's going to be great. It's going to be free. It's going to be free. That's the disguise. That's the disguise that sin promotes. But it's also the lie it promotes as well. Then Paul, what does he do? He challenges it. He says, so what benefit had you gained from the stuff that you're now ashamed of? <laughs> Now, now you want to talk about an educated way of basically of basically saying, <laughs> basically saying, how's it turn out? <laughs> How was it for you? <laughs> and you, and, and you, you know what folks say that they say it in a sarcastic way, but it's like, yeah. no, you know, how 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 did how did how did that uh, deal out for you? How, how do you like that? <laughs> yeah, did you feel like a fool? Yeah. Did that work for you? <laughs> okay, so y'all know I tell y'all it's kind of funny. So I was, I was coming to church at this time where everything was 
my, my, my body was different my mind was. So uh, when I fellowship ministered and then God let this go, Reverend Fry asked me, he said, well, he said, when you drink, you get drunk. If you smoke, you eat, you don't get high. What do you get out of cutting? Uh, <laughs> I, I like that one. I actually I like that one. What do you get? I don't know about the other person <laughs> I'm cussing out, but at the moment that I'm cussing them, I feel fine. I'm good with it. He said, do you know how it feels when somebody say that to you? I say, yes. He said, well, why would you make somebody else feel that that you feel? Mm-hmm. I said, well, okay, so let's be clear. I said, I feel good. I'm at that moment that I'm saying it. I don't care about your feelings. I, I didn't care. I, mm, I felt like I was good. <laughs> hey, what? And then we, I was good with it. But he, he had to make me think about how somebody else is feeling about what I'm, what's coming out of your mouth. mouth. Mm-hmm. And he said, and not only that, Teresa, you know that's a sin, right? <laughs> so that kind of just stopped me in my tracks because, see, I I took after my mother. Lord knows I love my mom, and she has calmed down a whole lot. I was a cut. <laughs> I, I was. The only was. people that I didn't get was. 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 The <laughs> see? Past tense. The only people that didn't get cut that were old people and babies. Those in between, you know, you're going to catch all this. But I'm much better now. But I, he had to make me think about how how is it making you feel? Is it make, is it really making you feel good? Good. Is it to make somebody else feel bad? I had to think about it. Again, what you just said, Teresa. Think about it. that's the deception of sin. What I was talking about before. That's the deception of sin. The deception is you're gonna feel free. You're gonna feel good about it. It's gonna be fine. But all the while, you're producing death. Yeah. All the while, you're killing yourself. And see, this, this is where this all comes in. Because Satan uh, gives the rules, gives the disguise that you're going to be free when you do all this. But what he's basically doing is that you think you're free, but all I'm doing is throwing ball and chain every time you do this. He said, because you're going to feel there's a need to do it and a necessity to do necessity to do it, he said, and you're going to find yourself in further incarceration to the point that you can continue to believe the lie that it's freeing you, and it's not. And it's not. And that's and that's why that, that connection, again, I told, you, I told you Paul is educated. He, talked, he said, what, what benefit does this reap you? What, what benefit does it reap for the things that you're now ashamed of? <laughs> just, just the language, Brother Bennett, the, just the language in and of itself. That's why I love, I, when I read Paul, I'm like, he had just this very scholarly way of making you really think about it. And then, like, what is he really trying to say? Oh, no, all he's basically trying to say is, did that work for you? In a sarcastic way. That's what he's trying to kind of say to you. Exactly, exactly. So what benefit? Because now you're thinking like, yeah, that really didn't benefit. Yeah, drinking a, you know, a fifth area, area of the day, you know, really didn't benefit me. You know, doing all this other stuff that I was doing in sin didn't benefit me. So now if it didn't benefit you, God is saying, well, that you now realize that. Well, here's the better way and why you need to be a slave to righteousness rather than the sin. And then he ends it by saying, of course, um, he's, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm reading, reading here in uh, verse 22. Um, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. Then he ends it with this phrase that is a very most quoted scripture in the Christian church. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So every time you sin, you're earning death. It's almost as if you're getting a a a a, a death note. That that like with, oh 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 you want sin? Here you go. Here, here's here, here, here's 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 five dollars of death, ten dollars of death, twenty dollars of death. Every here's more death for you. It's coming. That's your wage. That's what you've earned. The wages of sin is death. But the gift 
of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You have one option here that leads to death. You have another option here that leads to eternal life. And it is through Christ. It's through Christ. <laughs> but but also, the only, I, I use I just use it as an example because that's what Paul that's what Paul is reiterating. He's just trying to reiterate that so that people understand that that there's no there's no benefit that you're going to have or reap by continuing to sin. It's going to hurt you more than anything else. Up with but, what you said to me. But yeah, but you, what you said to me, and again, it's, me. it is the communication, again, of death. Because sin equals yeah. death. And that's why I keep saying what I'm saying, saying in regards to this, uh, the study of Romans. If you, got, you get nothing else out of it, if you get that sin equals death, you got pretty much most of it. Because that's, that's really where it, what it boils down to. Sin and death are equal. To gain the whole world and lose a soul. Yeah, in another way. What what is the profit? What is the benefit? A man gain the whole world to to cheat and to sin and to do all this other stuff. And, and what does it gain you? And then you lose your soul and no eternal life because you believe the lie of sin. Before you say it, take a second. Is this going to hurt me? Is it going to hurt the other person? And is it going to hurt God? If the answer to that is yes, then you need to find another way to say it. Because you don't want to, you're not trying to tear nobody down. You're trying to get your point across. And you don't have to say it. If, if you don't understand it, if you never understand it, now you heard it. How you've heard most of your life is this is the way I'm going to say it, and you can take it however it's going to be taken. Then that's the way you say it. I'm not, I, I'm not taking it back. I may apologize for the way I said it, but what I said, you got the gist of it. If I say this is not what you want to do right now, now that's what I say. I want you to think about it before you come over here to me. Because when you come out with that same face you got on that side of the room, I want you to keep that same face when you come over here. That's the way I have to say I mean, I have no other way to say I'm still guarding my words. Uh -huh. I'm not, I'm not cussing like uh, I heard the pastor say earlier. I'm not what I used to be. Not where I want to be. But I'm just going to let you know the same face you got over here. I want you to keep it when you come over here. And now I'm not going to cuss you out, but the word is going to come out of my mouth. It's going to sound something much calmer. And when you walk away, you're still going to be in tears because I'm still hurting your feelings. So, so the question, you know, becomes is that again, I'm not to. Well, well, it's it's the, it's the matter again of, of you looking at what it is that you're saying mm -hmm. and holding that under the, the auspices of what the Holy Spirit. Is working on in you in order to present it that way. Now, it's one thing to tell someone the truth, and you're not trying to purposely hurt them, okay? Or is it hurt? But to tell the truth, the truth is going to have some level of a reaction, re reaction to it. And sometimes the truth does, the truth does hurt. That's why they say, "Well, the truth cuts you." Well, that's the whole point of circumcision. So what we talked about before, the whole aspect of circumcision of the heart. So again, it's not that I'm trying to hurt your feelings. I'm telling you this really in love because you're going to end up finding somebody who can care less about Christ. And if you come come at, at them with the same attitude, that you might you you make you may catch whatever whatever hell they're dealing with on the inside spiritually. So this is why it is so important that we you know we try we definitely guard our hearts, we guard our minds in regards to the things that we do. We hold those under subjection 
to the cross, to the Holy, to the Holy Spirit. And I want you to think about even when you go through a particular action, is this going to hurt Christ, hurt Christ, uh, or is it, going, is it going to give ministry to who he is and the character of who God is? We're not trying, we're not trying, when, when we sin against God, basically in so many words, what, what happens is, is we basically say that the cross, what Christ did on it was of no, of no effect. It was of no effect. So now what essentially what we're doing is we're, we're throwing that same cat of nine tails again on Christ. We're, we're, we're throwing, uh, we're spitting at him when we spit at somebody else. See, see this spot, this right here, love the Lord your God on your heart and so your mind is stripped and love your neighbor as yourself. That's why it's so important to understand that because what you're doing is you're holding under subjection, subjection, sin, that you would have just as well cast off on Jesus himself while he was on the cross. But when you hold back, you're saying, Lord, you're, you have victory over all that. So since you have victory over it, why should I indulge my character in it when you have transformed me? So that's where the victory comes in, is that you truly have to know and understand the victory of the cross. Um, there's a book by, I read a seminary years ago by John Stott called The Cross of Christ. And all he talks about is the power that's in the cross. He talks about how much power the cross has to make transformation. When we're reminded of what happened there, he said it makes transformation for our own lives. And it begins to show in effect the, the power and transformation of what Christ did at Calvary. Because so much sin was thrown on him. And if we go through the process of continuing to sin, we're basically throwing rocks at, at Christ symbolically while he was still hanging there. And not saying that the victory of Christ on the cross and the resurrection and the grave is of null effect because we know it is of effect in transforming and transfiguring our complete being. And when you see where you're growing in Christ, that's where you begin to point back to cross. Hey, I know what happened at Calvary. I know the power of what it did for me to save me from my sins. And that's why you're seeing the improvement because I'm allowing the resurrection of Christ to have a resurrection effect on me. This on me. This is so an experience and you didn't have how you got a cyber six-year-old that sounded exactly like and I'm, I, I heard it out of my, with my own ears, and I was in one room, and she was outside. I was like, oh, my God, that's me. That's me. Mm, see? That's, mm -hmm. that's me. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, yeah, it's, it's still it, that, that power of life and death. Yeah. And in the tongue, I was like, oh, ooh. And my, my stepmom was outside with her, and she was like, Seven Mary. I was like, <laughs> don't, don't, no, just say Teresa. Because that was me. That was my fault. I did that. I did that. And then I had to not only retrain them, mm -hmm. I had to retrain myself. Because you don't want your five-year-old to, 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 be, to be saying that. To be saying that. And, and, and when, when you hear it from someone else and you realize that they got that from you, it, do, it, it, it does something to you. Mm -hmm. it, it, does, it does something to your spirit. And you're like, whoa, yeah, that, that's, yeah there's got to be some reform there. Exactly. Exactly. Because what, what it basically does, it, again, it puts the cross and says the cross and the power thereof and the resurrection has no effect. It doesn't have an effect, has an effect. 
And we cannot do that from the perspective of knowing what we believe and not trying to make the faith some fashionable item, fashionable item where now we showcase it uh, as as some uh, flamboyant, some flamboyant thing when really it's about rectifying your heart, rectifying your mind, transitioning and transforming you into the likeness of Christ. That's what it's about. And so that connection must feel, be filled in, must always continue to be filled in. But it takes improvement and also it takes the aspect of a choice, of a choice to be say, to say, you know what, I'm going to be a slave to righteousness. I'm going to obey God because that's the favorable way that God wants me to live if I say and I believe that I'm saved, that I'm saved. And, that, and it's, so, it's so apparent even in, in the midst of where, where we are. Uh, we have a few more minutes. I want, I want to get into uh, chapter 7, this first part. And it says, do you, verse, uh, chapter one, uh, uh, chapter seven, verse one. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law uh, and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So you, the, the, the example he uses here is to show what it is, how, how we are really not bound not bound by the aspect again of the law. He uses it in human in human terms, in human terms. But let me I'm gonna get to the second half of this because of time. Uh, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore full uh, bore, uh, bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Of the written code. Because again, the law only was established to show us what sin actually is. It's not something to say, well, you're held to this contract. You're held to this. No. The whole point is is that all of this was to give you give you the full uh, uh, the full document, the full book on what sin is. And Jesus summed it up as as, as probably be better than anyone. He said at the end of the day, when someone told him, he said, I follow the law, law and the commandments, I do all these things and so forth. He said, well, which one, which, which is more important? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. But equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. This fulfills the law and the prophets. If you do those, the centerpiece to all those commandments was love. The centerpiece was love. It was love. He said, if you do those two, love God and love God's creation. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's me looking at you, you or you or you in the eye and seeing a reflection of me. We are in the image. We're in the image of God. So seeing that reflection says, okay, that's not just Jake Adams. That's also a reflection of, of me as well. And all that means is is that you're able to see your limitations and your humanness through the eyes of others. And when you're able to see yourself in that way, you're getting closer to God's truth because that's going to make it easier for you to love that individual that you're looking at. Because not only are you looking at them, you're not looking at them to judge them. You're looking at them because you realize this is a reflection of who I am. So how good am I? 
How good am I? And I hope they see me the same way. <laughs> but Sister Neely, that's what, it, that's what it boils down to because what it does, it throws the barriers out of the window. It throws it out the window. And it says, who am I? Who am I to say I'm so haughty? Who am I to say I'm so great? Who am I to say that I'm all this in a bag of chips? And if I say that, and I look at you and try to judge you, shame on me. Shame on me because you, you, everyone in this room were reflections of each other. Why? Because God created every last one of us. That's why sometimes a testimony to a sinful person out there, say, well, you got to live your testimony. You know, that's not you. You got to where you come from and what you done done and what God <laughs> has done in your life and moved it. Exactly. Be honest about it. Throwing transparency, throwing barriers down so that you can look, so that we can look at each other and both realize that we're poor, we're blind, and we're naked. But more importantly, because we realize those truths, we also realize that we need each other. And we're not, we're still sinners. Exactly. We're still sinners. Saved by grace. That's the only difference. Saved by grace. Yep, a whip. A work in progress. We got less time on this side than we used to. And knowing and knowing that we're sinners. Knowing that we're sinners. And, and, knowing, and knowing that actually should give you a better sense of God's peace. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, it'll give you even more interaction, better interaction with other individuals, not only in the church, but also elsewhere. It will help. It'll help you to to, to really appreciate humanity for, at, a, at a greater at a, at a greater um, at, a, at a greater clip, if you will. Because uh, when you begin to see that, um, that that begins to help help you to understand various things. One one of the things that I'm kind of in 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 with this, um, Doctor um, you know, late Doctor Willie Rogers, uh, my mentor, one of my mentors. Um, he, he, was, he was a very open thinker. And one of the things is, and in, in, in with, with uh, his, his Mississippi flair, that was the other piece, because uh, he's born and bred, he was been born and bred in Mississippi, Lord have mercy. Um, he began to open me up when I was in school to a lot of things I thought a preacher probably would not indulge in. Okay? And so, he, I think this was between my, this was my junior year. This was going to my junior year. He, he's like, uh, he said, what you doing tomorrow, Sean? I said, I'm not doing anything. He was like, he said, we're going to go somewhere. Well, it's Reverend Rogers, so I'm not really questioning that, you know, where it is we're going. So I said, where are we going? He's going to Stone Mountain. I said, okay, we'll Stone Mountain. We're going to Stone Mountain Park? Yeah. I said, okay, we'll Stone Mountain Park. Packs up a cooler, has sodas in it. And he said, I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to the Peace Street Jazz Festival. I said, Rev. I said, we're going to the Jazz Festival. He was like, yeah, we're going to the Peace Tree Jazz Festival. That's where I'm going. I need to expose you to jazz. So we went to the Peace Tree Jazz Festival. That was my first time ever being at a jazz festival and had known, not really known much about jazz until he exposed that to me. Now, we're sitting under a canopy watching all these performers. Brian Culberson, uh, who was it? Najee. Um, Kenny G was out there. Those a host of folks. And we're sitting there just drinking soda, just listening. Now, there are folks around us that are smoking weed. <laughs> it is evident. It is evident and it is pungent in the air. And so, so Rev, Rev literally... Uh, Rev literally he was talking to some people whatnot, and, and, and just conversing with them and then they come to find out here Rev folks yes, yes, yes. folks put, trying to put stuff out and Rev immediately told him he said he said I'm not Jesus he said however he said I'm, I'm here brought this young man out here to expose him to give him a better world view of things in the world and things in the world he said because 
from where I stand, he said, these are many of the things we have to deal with. He said, and it's to be truly of in the world, but not of the world. He says, so he, I have no problem going to listen to jazz and taking young students with me. And so he said, because at the end of the day, I'm going to cycle this back through the life of Christ. And I'm going to show them as a campus minister how you can engage the world. How can you engage the world, but still keep your integrity as a Christian? As a Christian. But but it, and but I think in, in his in his in the way in the way he approached it was this way he said he said I'm not here I'm not here to judge you and he made it clear that he said, I'm not judging you at all and that's not why I said what I said to let you know that I was a preacher on campus he said but I, I honestly and truly believe there's something to be learned even in the midst of some ill activity that may be going on he said I'm not saying you continue to do that but I, what I'm also saying is is that I would rather meet you on this level and talk to you. In, in this regard, in a place where you don't feel infringed. He says, that's why I don't bring up the pastor piece or any of that until maybe unless I'm asked. He said, unless I'm asked. But he said, he makes it a point. He said, I just want, for I want to understand and get, get my kids to understand there's a greater aspect of world that you're going to have to deal with with regards to this gospel. And you've got to know how to approach it in such a way where Jesus doesn't become confrontational but becomes truly what God is which is love love in spite of love the Lord your God but also love your neighbor as yourself I noticed you turned the cross thing down Sunday yeah, I turned around. Yeah, because, because yeah, because Jesus was hidden. I'm like, oh, that's not. Oh, I know. Oh. I was sitting right there. <laughs> 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 that's what I'm saying. I noticed it right Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So you know, turning around because yeah, the symbol comes out front because you know Jesus is not hidden. No, when they exposed you, they put Jesus out front. Exposed him. There he is in the middle. See, and that's even the thing about the cross is that even in his suffering and even when they tried to humiliate him, they were still praising him. And that's what they didn't realize. They set him in the middle, set him high so everybody could see him. Then they put a sign over his head trying to be sarcastic, but they were putting the truth up there. Here's Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. I'm like, you put it up there to humiliate. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. So... So that gave gave a printout for everybody to say, "Oh, oh, that's Christ. That's the one. That's the one." So he was still, even in his own in his humiliation, he was still exalted. See, that's 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 the thing. God has a way of still placing placing the proper perspective on Christ, even when you try to humiliate. That when you're trying to down him, you, you're, you think you're downing him, but you're actually lifting him up. And God is using you to do it. Oh, that's amazing. That he's still high and lifted up. And you're trying to humiliate him. Not knowing that you're fulfilling scripture, fulfilling, fulfilling prophecy. That's why I know God is in control of all this. Because, again, when you see these connections in the Bible of Old Testament and New Testament, how, how it all bridges, it's not an accident. I'm sorry. It, it's, it's just the way that everything was phrased and placed out and put out, God ordained all of it. He ordained all of it. And then through his prophets said it would happen. Thousands of years before it actually happened. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was beaten for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. But wow. You know, when you did Revelation, the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. it, and you say, well, Revelation, even though it's the ending, but it was the beginning back in Genesis. And you kind of showed us how the, the bridge. Uh, the bri how, how they, how they bridge together. Right. 
how they bridge together. And that's why even, even now, Revelation should never be a book that you're scared to study. Well, see, I was scared of Revelation <laughs> until we did that because, you know, the, even the preachers don't, don't even preach like that anymore. Yeah. And, and and yeah yeah and and actually the book the book of Reve the, the book of Revelation actually should be one of the most freeing books for anyone once you realize and you, you're able to decipher through much of that Daniel code that's in there and know what these things mean and so forth but you gotta always remember where that book starts it starts with what it starts with the seven stars of Asia Minor the seven stars of Asia Minor which were the seven churches the seven churches. So, so, so where, where Revelation begins, where Revelation begins is actually where it ends. Because remember, every church that Jesus spoke about, the gate that, uh, Rev, uh, that John heard the revelation of Jesus through, in the book of Revelation, it says, you're doing these things well, but I have this against you. I have this against you. I have this against you. And then he gets into all the code talk to talk about the end times. But remember, all of that is all to talk about is all to talk about what the church must be doing in the end times to make sure that the gospel is preached and spread. and spread because these times are coming. And for the place where all this stuff is coming, who is going to have to be most equipped to handle it? The church. The church. The church. The church. And that's, and that's why Revelation is so powerful because it is to point the finger back at the church and say, are you doing the most and the best that you can to ensure that the teaching and preaching of the gospel towards salvation of them that believe is being done appropriately and you are telling them the truth about the things that will happen even if you're gone. And it hasn't happened yet. The word of God has, said, has already said, it will happen. It will happen. It was happening, but it was slowly happening. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like when that disease came, it was so, you know, so much of what I could see. I went to the doctor because I saw, I read about this, but I thought I was not see and, 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 and again, these, these, rea these realities... The, these realities come forward and, and you begin to look at Revelation much differently from that perspective. And remember, this is the vision that John saw, that God allowed him to see it on the Isle of Patmos. And when you see all these things about these angels with wings that have eyes on them, and, and so all these things mean something. And the earthquakes and the, and the fire. I mean, and, and, the, and the kick. Disasters and the kingdoms that would be that would be established and the kingdoms that would fall that would you know everything just falling in place now. And 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 I told y'all before I said the clip the clip notes version clip notes version of, of of the book of Revelation is from the words of Jesus in Matthew twenty four. That's the cliff notes version. G Jesus literally tells tells it out yeah. in in Matthew twenty four. And literally, when you read Revelation, you study Revelation, you can't help but to go back to Matthew 24 and to Daniel 9 because all of it is there. I said, what did you call it? He said it was the birth pains. Yeah. Yeah, the birth pains of the earth. He said, these are, these are, and what, what did Jesus say? He said, these are what? The beginnings of birth pains. Beginning, they'll, they'll be the beginnings. Not the, the end hasn't come yet, but these are the, this is the beginnings of birth pains. To us. Yeah, it's like you don't know what's what been said, things that's gonna happen. But Christians, you know, we study the word and different stuff. We we know we 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 shouldn't be like we shocked about the mm -hmm. things that are all that keeps that going on because it's been told. Told. So you about to say Uh, was that not, it's Isaiah? It's Isaiah. It's Isaiah. Um, I want to say, I want to say Isaiah nine, but I might be wrong. Maybe Isaiah six. six I, think. Uh, I think it's Isaiah six, um, where literally this this beginning this is the beginning of the call of Isaiah, um, where I'm, I'm going. To, yeah, this is a commission. I think. Yeah, here it is. I'm, I'm reading now. 
Yeah, yeah. In the year that King Uzziah died, mm -hmm. I saw the Lord high and exalted. He uh, seated on the throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces and the, uh, and the two, uh, and with two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. I hope y'all know this is also a reference to the, to the Ark of the Covenant. This is a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, to the two, the two, the two, sera, the two seraphim. Yeah, yeah. At, 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 the, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, uh, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Send me. We went through the whole Bible. Well, well, yeah, there, yeah, it was, it was, and, and what you see is, is that there, there are all these pieces that are connected, oh, yeah. that and they're and they're sewn together. Yeah. They're sewn together, and I think this is why it's it's so apparent when you when you get to Revelation that we almost had an expiration, almost a Cliff Notes version of the Bible as we went through the whole book, because you, you're seeing all these things have already been said, things have already been spoken, things have already transpired. When you read, that's why I said, I said, y'all get ready when we study Revelation. We're going to be in the, in the book of Daniel for quite some time. Because yeah. I said much of the book of Revelation is direct references to the prophecy that was given to Daniel. And it's given in almost a similar coded language that, that Daniel even received it in, in the, book, in the book of Daniel. So I said there are, there are correlations that are there. Yeah. So why would God drop it? In in a God in a, in, a, in a book called a book of Daniel, then it comes back again when when John is on the Isle of Patmos and he pretty much brings it back up again and then translates it of what it actually means. It's amazing. Yes. Yes. How how the ground shook, <laughs> how it shook and it broke the chains. <laughs> hey, how how the earth. Earthquake happened when Jesus died on the cross and shook and tore the temple in two from top to bottom. These things aren't coincidences. These are acts of God. And that's why I, when I go back to the crucifixion, I said, think about this. Think about three in the afternoon, excuse me, from noon to three in the afternoon, and it's getting dark. That's the high point of the day. That's the place where light is supposed to be at the highest. And because the Son of Man who was the light of the world, yeah. was dying on the cross because of sin, yeah. God said, I'm, I'm going to let, no, I'm, no, I refuse to allow the sun to shine. And it was dark. Folks were being raised from the dead when Jesus was dying. See, see that, see that, that right there, and when you see these incidents in the Bible, they're not by happenstance. And when people, 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 were there, these things were documented and folks were there. Folks were there when Jesus was baptized. They heard the voice of God speak. They heard it. They heard it. Spoke. Here's, here's a, a, a dove descending, who's descending now, descending now. Jesus is being baptized and all, all of a sudden a voice speaks out of nowhere. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. They heard the voice. They heard the voice. Power. Power. But that shows you how God can ex can show His power, but still be so humble. But it was no accident that, so he, that you had to read the Revelation. No, it prepared us. Yeah, because because that was that was before the pandemic, and we we did a whole year study in Revelation. And when everything shut down, I was like, wow. <laughs> it's, it's a play because it, because it shut the world down. 
it shut the world down. And that's when I when when when, when I saw the basketball game and when they called that basketball game in Utah. That's where it all started. And I'm sitting there with my brother and, and trying to enjoy uh, the celebration um, with he, he and his wife just getting married. We're looking at the television. I'm like, I'm looking at Taryn. I'm like, it's going down. That's exactly what I told her. I said, it's going down. It's going down now. We're on the road. As we're heading back, I'm like, I said, Taryn, I said, I could feel the uneasiness. By the time we got to Charlotte, that's when, oh, Eric, that's when, that's when, that's when everything yeah. shut down. I'm like, wow. I'm like, the whole world has just shut down. And driving through the street. I was dri driving through the street. It was nobody. I'm like, nobody. I'm like, I see, if God is, if God is not speaking, mm -hmm. if you're not realizing God is speaking, you're not speaking, something's wrong. I said, because this is not normal. No, it's not. At all. And it wasn't normal no more after this either. <laughs> they can't <laughs> sing, sing. They going back to number one. The over, over, over what twenty thousand people? Thirty now, thirty thousand people over in Turkey, over, over in, in that that, earth, that that earthquake, an earthquake. There, there's things happening around the world, y'all, and that and again, it's speaking to a lot of things. I believe God has already spoke. We we don't know the time. God does know, but I honestly believe I believe we're closer now than we were back back yes. three even a year ago yes. because. Uh, yeah, in Michigan, in Michigan State, there have been more mass shootings than there have been days this year. Than days in the year. I think we're up to, what, 70 almost? 68, 70 mass shootings? And we haven't even gotten through month two? I thought the children of Israel were some of the godly we take. Amazing. I said, Lord, we are so bad, but thank God you. Amen. 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 When we when we come back next week, we will we will hit uh, the second half of uh, chapter seven, and we're gonna be that's where we're gonna be. We're gonna be in the second half of chapter seven. I'm not even gonna move to chapter eight because so much in that second half of chapter seven that we're gonna have to talk about and unpack. So pray that y'all enjoyed everything. Thank you for all the conversations tonight. I know a lot of people are enjoying have joined and so forth. Uh, thank you just for being here uh, online tonight. And we're going to have a word of prayer just to close us out uh, on tonight. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word that truly is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, directionally, O Lord, showing us, guiding us, moving us, pointing us in the direction we should go. Lord, even in these turbulent times of oh God, you are still the Lord of all. You're still the God of creation. And we ask right now, Lord, that this, what we went through tonight, oh God, will help us, oh God, on the journey. And Lord, set us up even, Lord, to be your will next week to go through, Lord, chapter 7, the remainder of chapter 7, oh God. And to understand the correlation, oh Lord, between uh, the aspect of spiritual warfare that we go through through our flesh. And Lord, trying to make our fle flesh, Lord, submit to your righteousness, oh God. So in that, Lord, I, I, I pray that we are intimate with that word on next week and as we were even tonight. We ask right now, Lord, lead us from this place, not from your presence. Give us mercies wherever we're going and allow us, Lord, to see your glory in the days to come. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.